You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Options Bootcamp is brought to you by NASDAQ. From its inception, NASDAQ has been an innovator and agent of change in the financial markets. It's in our DNA. From the development of electronic trading to our drive to bring enhanced functionality and world-leading technology to our suite of six options exchanges, we exemplify customer focus, consistent technology, and streamlined solutions. NASDAQ, tech forward, leading the U.S. options market and continually rewriting tomorrow. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your options bootcamp drill instructors, Mark Longo, Dan Passarelli, and Jill Malandrino. All right, everybody. You know, it's fun. It's fun to hear that music again. It has been too long. Yes, it is time. Time for Options Boot Camp, the show where we answer your burning options questions. We explain all of these crazy things called options to you. Maybe you're a basic retail stock guy. You want to dip your toes into those options waters. Maybe you've been playing around with options for a while, but you got some questions. Hey, we all do. It's the nature of the beast. Either way, we got you covered here on Options Boot Camp. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Coming at you live today, so a little fun surprise, a little fun, sneak a little boot camp live surprise in there for you, so if you can join us live in the chat. We'd love to see you in there. If not, of course... We love all of our podcast friends. You know that's how most of you get the show, so <laughs> don't worry. But we gave you nice to give you a little bonus. That's why it's worthwhile to follow us over there on the Mixler platform. You never know; it's going to be coming at you live during the week. Fun interviews, fun shows like this, all sorts of surprises lurking on that live feed. So if you like your options info delivered directly into your ear holes immediately, Mixler is the place to go. And of course, joining me, I can't do the show without him. He's like. He's like the evil yin to my yang. He's like the dark side to my light side. I had the big Star Wars convention was in town this weekend, so I got Star Wars on the brain. He is, of course, Mr. Dan Passarelli, the maitre d, the man of the hour over there at Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. Maitre d, can I have a table for two near the kitchen, please? Right this way, sir. <laughs> for some delicious options feasting. Are you ready, sir? You got your you got your question answering pants on because we got a lot of questions to answer. You ready, sir? Brother, I was born ready. All right, since you were born ready, let's get to it with a little bit of the old mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. <laughs> You know, the fun thing about doing this show is that whenever we do it, the depths of January, who knows, the leafy days of fall, whenever we, it might be we're doing it, it's always 4th of July on this show, Dan, because it just, it just sounds so festive, so patriotic here. It is fun. Of course, we're going to do, because it's been a while since we've done one. I know I promised you more of these. We're going to get more of these shows going to you. But as you might imagine, we build up quite a back catalog of questions that you guys have. <laughs> And I don't blame you. We got a lot, a lot of things going on in the world of options that are crazy, that are twisted, that are weird, that are just hard to understand if you're coming at it for the first time. Uh, so we're going to walk you through it. You know, obviously, we don't do this show every all the time. So when those questions come into this show a lot, sometimes we have to route them to other shows just to make sure you guys get answered or we answer them directly. But we make sure we route a lot of them back here so you guys can hear it on your show of choice, the original show you sent them into, and also for the listeners of this show, which we know you are legion can all get some benefit out of it as well. So, all right, Dan, we're going to burn through as many as we can. Let's see if we can knock this uh, 
this stockpile of mail down to a manageable amount. Let's start off. Here's a good one. And it's right for you, Dan. So it's a perfect way to start off. Uh, let's see. This comes from Joe and Linda. So you have two fans, Jan. Just two, but two. At least you got two. So that's good, right? That's better than when you started the show with. You had zero. So there you go. Now you got two. Uh, Joe and Linda, uh, they say, they've, I have been knee deep with you guys for the last 14 months and can't thank you enough for the wealth of information uh, you provide. One of my favorite quotes, your generosity is only exceeded by my gratitude. I have a long commute to work in the morning and have managed to listen to all 240 plus of the options boot camp, or excuse me, options playbook episodes. So well done to you, sir. He says all of the options boot camp. So well done to you again. Uh, 90% of the OIC stuff, if you don't know listeners, we do a lot of shows uh, with the Options Industry Council as well. This added a new one called Coffee with Cot aimed at the advisor audience. So a couple of OIC shows coming out, very educational focused. Check those out if you haven't done so as well. And he says, and he's in and out of the Options Advisors and our TWIFO show this week in Futures Options. He also says, I haven't missed Option Block for the last few months. So Joe and Linda, I love you both. You guys are clearly devoted listeners, and uh, we thank you. Uh, he goes on to ask his question. Um, I purchased Dan's Trading Options Greeks. Look at this, Dan. People are buying your book. Look at this. I purchased Dan's Trading Options Greeks book and was wondering if he had an audio version. I could easily listen to it on my morning commute. Uh, you guys, thank you so much for all your help. Looking forward to the future with you guys. Going to be successful enough to be able to travel to thank you guys in person. Thanks again, Joe. So there you go, Dan. Uh, he wants to travel here to Chicago to thank us in person with his options earnings. Not a bad plan, huh? That is not a bad plan at all. I think later on I can tell you about an opportunity to do just that. Oh, look at you teasing. Uh, but yeah, he wants to know a pretty simple question. Do you, do you have an auto, and you have a lot of books out there, Trading Options Greeks. What are some of the other ones? Remind our listeners, Dan. Uh, yeah, Trading Options Greeks is sort of the big one. It's in its second edition, published in Simplified Chinese. Uh, so one everybody knows. Also, The Market Taker's Edge is the most recent one. And then I was lucky enough to be uh, a guest and kind of quoted and had a couple chapters in uh, some random books by some other folks who were nice enough to ask me to do that. Um, but uh, is there an audio version? You know, that is a question for my publisher. Uh, I think that they have not yet released an audio version, but you should call up Wiley and say, what the WTF? Get, let's get an audio version of Passarelli's book here, man. I think part of the challenge with the options stuff, too, is a lot of visual components, right? There's charts and graphs, and those are kind of hard to convey. I mean, we do it here because that's kind of we made our living doing That's kind of we've learned how to do it, but... It's a challenge if you're just a regular audiobook guy to be able to, to convey an options P&L graph in, in audio only form sometime. Wouldn't you agree, Dan? Well, yeah, uh, there is that. Because uh, I, I know for sure in a lot of, in, in both of my books, I say things like, take a look at this chart. And, you know, it's not going to come across so well when you're, you know, on the running trail or on the train or driving in your car. So maybe that's part of the problem, too, I guess. Yeah, the format is not exactly – and I know this because uh, I, I, we, I do a lot of audio, and so I get approached, as you might imagine, quite a bit by, uh, by different people who are options authors saying, hey, we like – you have a good voice for options. So why don't you do my audio book? <laughs> and the answer is always, well, you know, A, B, it's a lot of work. If you've, it's like days and days in the studio. Uh, so if I'm going to do it for somebody, you're going to have to make it worth my while. I, all the all the stories I've heard from people who narrate audiobooks that it is a horror show of a process. Oh. Like literally every sentence has to be, oh no, do it with this inflection, do it with that. And you have quite a few sentences in a book. Uh, so it's many, many days, 12-hour days, 10-hour days in a studio just reading, uh, which does, may not sound exhausting until you have to do it again and again and again. Then, yeah, trust me, as someone who speaks for a living, that's a lot of speaking. So, yeah, if you want me to do your audiobook, people out there, uh, you know, come come with heavy or don't come at all, as they say on The Sopranos, right? It's, uh, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, when you when you call up Wiley and say, "Get Passarelli's book on audio," we're gonna we're gonna get Mark to to narrate it with his the silky smooth sounds of his voice. The silky smooth options insider coming at you with um, options Greeks and all the other ones. Market Takers Edge. We'll just have a we'll have a plethora of audio. But I think I think there is a lot to be said. Maybe we can even do. 
like uh, maybe an excerpted version. Maybe there are certain chapters that are more conducive to audio than others. Uh, we make like the, maybe it was make the Dan Passarelli audio edition, you know, just like excerpts from all your greatest hits, you know, and uh, we do something like that. We leave out all the, you know, P&L graphs and all the other stuff that requires a little bit pulling over to the side of the road. You can't listen while you're driving. Uh, but yeah, I'm a fan. That's a good question, Joe. I'm a fan of audio books. I like them. And uh, as you might imagine. And so I think that's a good, uh, good question. So yeah, maybe, maybe we'll get one of those going for you. Maybe you've got the wheels spinning. Shoot the sh- forward that email to your publisher, Dan, and say, hey, look, let's get it going. All right. right. Let's see here. What do we got? We got uh, Rayman. Rayman 5839. <laughs> I love some of these numbers that people come up with their names. I, I, were, there, was, were there 5838 of other Rayman out there that they couldn't take? So he had to go up to 39? Who knows? Who knows how these numbers come about? But Rayman 5839 wants to know. He says, hi. Well, hello, Rayman. Uh, <laughs> is the option premium? Goes right into the question. I like it. Is the option premium counted toward exercising an option when in the money, I'm new to options, so thanks. And he goes on to ask, would it only be profitable then if the uh, intrinsic value heavily outweighs the extrinsic? Okay, so let me see what he's saying here. Is the option premium counted toward exercising an option? So listeners, and he says he's new to options, so first off, you're, at the, you're coming to the right show, Raymond. Well done. Uh, by premium, obviously, listeners, there's two components. We've talked about this before. Go back to some of our basic early episodes of this show. That's the nice thing about this show. It kind of never goes out of style. It never goes out of date. You can start at the beginning at any time, and we'll walk you through all the different concepts here. And uh, you don't have to worry about, oh, this, this just changed. <laughs> you know, Options are going to pretty much be options for the foreseeable future, unless they make some crazy changes. So all the things we talk about here, like these concepts of intrinsic and extrinsic value, stock and premium. Premium, you know, people use premium a lot. They throw it around out there. Uh, you know, I'm selling premium. I'm buying premium. They use it kind of as a general option buying and selling term to really mean all of the money that you're collecting when you're selling an option or when you're buying an option. Uh, but technically, what you're talking about is premium. It's what the name means. It's kind of extra, right? It's above and beyond what uh, you typically have. So that usually the premium actually refers to what is above extra on top of the intrinsic value of that option. Remember, intrinsic value, let's say, uh, let's go to the old XYZ. XYZ is trading at $55. You want to buy the 50 call. That's got $5 of intrinsic value. Remember, because it's $5 of value in the underlying. You could buy that call uh, for $5, execute it, or buy that stock just for 50 using the call, 50 call, and then immediately sell the stock for 55 in the marketplace. So there's $5 of meat on the bones. That won't go away. That's intrinsic value. So that's what he's talking about there. Premium is above it. Let's say the option might actually won't cost five dollars even. Maybe it'll cost five seventy five. So that seventy five cents is the premium. So that's what he's talking about. So he's saying if I exercise an option that's in the money, is the premium counted towards? So I, I assume Dan, maybe you have a different interpretation of that. I'm assuming what he's saying here is, do I get to keep all that <laughs> when I exercise an in the money option? And the answer is no. Uh, that's why everyone says don't ever exercise your options early, except for that one moment where it makes sense, which is is exercising a call early to capture a dividend. And how do you know when that's worth doing? Well, because you do some basic math. You take that premium. And by the way, if you confuse what the extrinsic value of your option is, it's pretty easy. You look at the other side of the options chain. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about in-the-money calls. So if the call is in the money, guess what? The put's out of the money. So the put is nothing but intrinsic value. So look to the other side of the chain. Let's say in this case, the put's trade in 75 cents. Hey, guess what? I got 75 cents of, of fluff, of extra, of premium on this strike. And that's exactly what you're going to lose if you exercise it. Because you exercise it, that means you're getting exactly the intrinsic value, getting that exactly that difference and no more. So it's like you're selling that money, that option. Effectively, it's what you're doing is you're selling that option for parity. And that means you're doing worse. If you could sell it for five seventy-five in the marketplace right now, why would you sell it for just five even by exercising it effectively for five dollars only the intrinsic value? So that's why everyone says don't do it. Uh, obviously, the scenario. Let's say you want to capture a dividend with that call. Let's say the dividend's a dollar and that premium and the put's only seventy-five cents. Well, guess what? Then it's worth doing. Then you could exercise it. Get, lose that 75, but you're making a buck, so you're actually making 25 cents. So that's the only time when it's worth exercising the option early. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Unless you have some weird aberrant scenario, you need to do it. Or sometimes some people have put forth this, which does make sense, and it, can, it does happen rarely. Very wide spreads, so you can't really even reliably execute in the middle sometimes. 
Uh, and so the, usually the midpoint will be somewhere around that parity usually. So maybe exercising could actually get you a better fill than if you sold it in the marketplace. So that's an extreme example, but it can happen. Illiquid names. Uh, but other than that, really at capturing the dividend. Uh, so he asks again, would it be profitable only if the intrinsic value heavily outweighs the intrinsic? Well, you, you're losing. Whatever extrinsic you have is gone. So long as you're okay with that, if it's only like a penny, whatever, if you're deep in the money, there may not be a lot of intrinsic, uh, extrinsic, extrinsic say, value on that. It may just be a couple of cents, in which case it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But in general, I don't know, Dan, this is probably a confusing question, I'm sure, for a lot of people who come to you guys at Market Taker. Uh, they think if they exercise an option, they just get all that money, right? They get all that juicy premium, when in reality, you know, they lose a good chunk of it. Yeah, I mean, to me, the best way to think about it, like... You know, part of the benefit of doing a show with Mark is that he just really likes to talk for a really long time. So I get I get time to think about my answer. <laughs> I set you up, dude. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so so um, so, yeah, you know, uh, like to me, like the best way to think about it, I like to try and break things down into, you know, like like kindergarten examples, you know, like nobody likes to waste money. And when you exercise an option, you take the money the option's worth and just throw it away. But but in the right case, that's okay, right? Because an option is worth whatever price the option is. You know, like you look at your trading screen, whatever price it says there, I mean, that's effectively what it's worth. I mean, we can fine-tune that statement, but it's it's basically right. Yeah, so if I exercise it, I lose that. But the reason it's worth that is because, you know, if it's a 50-strike call that gives me the right – to buy the stock at 50 and the stock's at 55, it's worth $5 because I can get $5 if I exercise it. So, so basically, all I'm really doing is exchanging one item of value for another item of value. I'm, I'm exercising this call that's worth $5 and, you know, throwing away $5, if you will, but I'm getting a stock at 50 that I can immediately turn around and sell at 55. So, I mean, it's worth $5 of profit, instant profit to me. So, you know, I mean, to Mark's very good point, as long as, as long as there's not time value, you know, it doesn't matter. You're just exchanging, you know, uh, one unit of value for the exact same unit of value, just in a different form. Uh, oh, in one point two, I, I'm not sure if this was at the heart of your uh, question, but um, most brokers, when you exercise it, you'll probably have to pay commission uh, on the stock that you purchase through the exercise. Um, so you know, know that, which is why for me, being when I'm acting with my option trader hat on, I never want to get assigned or exercise because there's an extra commission there. Um, when I'm it, using my investor hat, then I don't really care because it's a transaction I'd make either way. Well said, sir. All right, let's see what else we got. A related question. Uh, this comes from Thomas Thomas Weber. He wants to know, if I am short a deep in the money call, everyone's got deep in the money calls on the brain today, Dan. If I'm short a deep in the money call in SPY, and he puts in parentheses, excuse me, a delta near one, uh, one or 100, depending on what your chosen vernacular is, listeners. Uh, what are the odds I will be assigned before Friday expiration? Uh, since I, I answered far too lengthily on the last one for your taste, Mr. Dan, I'll let you go first. You go crazy. Uh, what do you have to say for Thomas here? A related in-the-money call exercising early question, Dan. Um, wait a minute. Can you read the question as is just one more time to make sure I understand exactly where he's coming so from? If I, am, if I am short a deep in the money call in SPY, and he puts in parentheses a delta near one, what are the odds I will be assigned before the Friday expiration? So he's asking about effectively what are the reasons why you would exercise a call earlier, right? Why would you get assigned on one early? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, this has a little something to do with, uh, at least indirectly, something, something Mark brought up uh, earlier. So this, this, this is actually a pretty insightful question. I think this is going to be really helpful to our listeners. Um, it's, it's helpful even though you know, you're never going to be a market maker. You're never going to trade like a market maker because they just do something completely different that's not relevant to your style of trading if you're not a market maker. But it's, it's helpful to understand exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it. So when, when a market maker uh, trades an option, 
he delta hedges, he or she delta hedges it immediately. <clears throat> so because delta is basically your biggest risk, so they get rid of their biggest risk immediately by buying or selling shares of the underlying. So uh, in the case of if a market maker buys a call, which means you sell a call, so the market maker buys it from you, what they do is they short stop. Uh, if a market maker uh, buys a put, meaning you would sell a put, the market maker buys stock. Okay, so then th basically they've just taken an offsetting position to, to offset the delta in the underlying. So let, let's look at this uh, backwards. Let's talk about the puts first, which you didn't ask about, but let's talk about them first. <clears throat> if a market maker buys like a really deep in the money put 100 delta and then they buy stock one to one, you know, I mean, if it's a big position, they might be buying a lot of stock. Well, guess what? Market makers trade leveraged. The, the rules that are set up for them allow them to buy stock in a very leveraged way, much more leveraged than, than you, you or I could. And so they effectively are borrowing money. I mean, if they got a lot of money, there's opportunity costs. So either way, there's an interest rate associated with it. So they're paying interest on that stock. They don't like to pay interest on that stock. So if the, if the put is really deep in the money, one to one, and there's no uh, time value, this is very related to the last question, fortunately. Um, they'll exercise that put because, you know, they're just long 100 deltas, short 100 deltas with no time value, meaning they can't make or lose money. I mean, they could lose money if it goes, you know, if the stock rises a whole bunch. So they're definitely going to exercise so they don't pay interest. But guess what? If they're long calls with 100 deltas, then they're short 100 shares against each contract they have. And Market makers, unlike a typical retail trader, which is us, you know, you, the listener, and uh, me and Mark these days anyway, market makers get paid interest on stock they're short. It's called a short stock rebate. Crazy, right? Because, you know, when you short stock, you get cash in your account and, and they earn interest on that cash. Guess what? People like earning interest. Well, let's just put the period at the end of that sentence. People like earning interest, right? Uh, you know, when I was a market maker, there were times when I was sure literally, like, hands, hands God, millions of dollars worth of stock in Ford and some of the bigger stocks that I, I traded. I was literally short or long millions of dollars of stock. I'm okay making interest on millions of dollars. So I don't want to exercise those calls and get rid of that short stock I'm earning interest on. The only reason I would is if there's a dividend coming, and then I would only exercise it right the day before the ex-dividend date, so I collect as much interest as I can, and then get the dividend. Yeah. I kind of turned that around on you, Mark, and yeah. then I was unwinded. Sorry. No, no, there you go. <laughs> see, that's why I set you up. See, sometimes, see, we, see, you know what it is? It's just the, the deep in the money call ones. They, they get us fired up for some reason. I don't know what it is. <laughs> they, but you know, it's funny. I've often said this before, and I don't remember this came in. Obviously, it came in around SPY. Uh, earning or sorry, dividend time because that's when these questions always come in, right? It's I can just check my I don't check my calendar. I can just check my email. Oh, it's about spy dividend time because that's when we get start getting these questions because that's when you're going to get it, right? He's, he asks specifically about spy, uh, and so uh, spy. The only time you really need to worry about that is really around that dividend, and you know it crops up usually around around similar times in the quarter, but not exactly. So you have to kind of pay attention to when that's coming up. It's not like it's one of those weird ones that the dividend is not like officially they don't announce it really that much ahead of time. It's kind of just comes up. But you have usually you can look at your past calendars and see when in the quarter it typically comes out. So you're prepared for it. When you're trading spy, and people always overwrite spy calls and everything else like that, and they forget there's actually a dividend in spy. So there are times when all of a sudden you look at your statement and say, wait a minute. Where'd all these uh, assignments come from? And that's why, because people are trying to capture uh, that dividend. So just bear that in mind when you're out there slinging calls willy-nilly and spy uh, that the, some of those could come back to uh, bite you, perhaps. If, it could be a good thing if they're exercised early. That could always work out for you. But uh, if you, you want to be make sure you're prepared for that eventuality. So if you're writing premium and spy, know there's a dividend. And so some of those, the calls at least, could be exercised early. So plan for that when you're out there writing calls like crazy and spy. All right, let's see here. Alto. Alto wants to know, uh, which do you think has a better chance of happening? No more earnings calls or after hours options trading? And which do you think would be more impactful for options traders? Do you have a preference? Well, Dan, I believe what he's referring to is uh, earlier this year, we saw 
maybe, maybe I think it was more towards the end of last year, actually. We saw an interesting push from a, from a, a wide variety of, of, of areas. I think Warren Buffett was pushing for it. So a few other big uh, financial names came out for it. I think even Trump weighed in on it, saying they want fewer earnings calls. Uh, so instead of like, you know, the once a quarter season we have now, spread it out more because this causes more turbulence and it's not an efficient and effective way to really disseminate information for people out there. So that was kind of a big drum beat. It seems to have to have died off a little bit, but it was a big drum beat maybe four or five months ago. And then the ever present boogeyman of, of after hours options. Tra- I, everyone wants the latter. If it's the retail side, listeners of the show, they all want it. A lot of the retail brokers want to give it to you. I've talked to a lot of them. They all kind of want to give it to you. It's the exchanges and a lot of the other groups that would have to staff the liquidity, the market makers, the trading firms who are less gung-ho about after-hours options trading. And from talking to all of them and uh, from hearing you know, the feedback from things like the SEC would have to approve such things, uh, then FINRA and others, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of impetus from them to make it happen. So there's kind of this weird gulf in the option space right now whereas retail and everyone interacts with retail the brokers and all the others they want that they want you to be able to trade our options 24 7 think about it. if you're a broker that's good for you you got to staff up a little bit more to man that but you got people around they usually manning risk anyway especially if you're doing futures which most of the big brokers are anyway uh so uh, you you got people there anyway so you may have to staff up a little bit more but people can trade all throughout the night which is good for you so you want that and you want your customers to be happy and clearly particularly around earnings season we get this call all the time or email in our case uh, hey, how come I can't buy, sell my calls on Google? The stock's up 200 handles in the after hours. How come I can't close it out? Uh, so, yeah, that's a, that's a constant source of frustration for a lot of our audience. Uh, which one has a better chance of happening? Ugh. Um, I don't think the earnings thing is going to happen. That's a, that's a big seismic shift anytime soon. So I guess neither one's going to happen anytime soon. I guess if I had to pick one, I probably would say the after hours options trading, even though I think that's not happening this year or anytime soon either. But I guess since it's a less macro-oriented thing, it has a better chance overall of happening. It's just the options market. Uh, Dan, you have any, anything on this one? After hours, options trading, or no more earnings calls? And which one? Oh, also the second question. Which would be more impactful? Um, I'm going to have to say the after hours, options trading, right? Because you can trade all day. <laughs> so that would be a good thing. Uh, Dan, what do you think here for Alto? Yeah, I mean... Dude, we got a great thing going. Don't F with it. Like, here's the thing. I mean, first of all, as far as earnings goes, why would you want to minimize that volatility? It's fantastic. And why would you want to take away from the ability to trade earnings? I mean, our probably our most popular class that's not a subscription class is our total earnings domination class uh, because – I mean, holy cow, it is like the best opportunity that comes around four times a year to make money, you know, like, yeah, no, keep it. It's, it's great just as is. <laughs> like, like I, I love trading earnings with the total earnings domination system. Don't help with it. <laughs> uh, you know, like, it's like saying. <laughs> I mean, and, and then, you know, just talking about market volatility in and of itself, you're option traders. How do you think you make money? That's like, you know, that's like saying, you know, it's like if you're a salesman, it's like, oh, hey, uh, take away my phone so that I, I don't have to call all those people. You know, I, I don't like opportunities to make money. You know, like <laughs> that's stupid. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting one. Uh, but yeah, I don't think, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending on your perspective, depending on where you are in the space, I don't think either one's happening anytime soon. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would like to see a little more options, pun intended, for our trading audience to be able to trade more throughout the day and night. I think, I mean, obviously, liquidity would be an issue if there's lots of things like that. But maybe it's a yeah, bit of a... I, oh, sorry, Mark. Uh, I have one more thing to say when you're done. No, sorry. Go ahead. Good. Yeah, but, but as far as the other one, uh, you know, like... Um, talking about extending hours for option trading, man, I hate, I hate to say this, and I don't necessarily believe in this, but just looking at history, uh, it's almost like you can call a market top because when people start talking about extending option trading into after hours, it's always a market top. So I, I hope people aren't talking about that too much. I mean, I I haven't been following, but like, you know, because what happens is like 
when the market's really, really great for trading, you know, people trade more options and they're just making money and they're like, this is freaking great. Let's extend the hours. And then it's, you know, and then when so many people are just killing it, it all good things come to an end. So I hope too many people aren't talking about that. <laughs> I never thought about it from the contrarian perspective. That's why you're the black headed guy. You know, you can think of it from the dark side. I like it. Uh, yeah. So maybe that is the sign that the worm is, uh, is turning out there. I like it. Uh, all right. Let's see. Um, what do we got here? We got... So <laughs> there's another creatively named individual, 6654P. They want to know, uh, why are options on SIBO and CME Group viewed differently? Mm, okay, a lot, a lot to unpack here. Uh, by, by SIBO, I'm assuming he loosely means the entirety of the equity option space. So that's kind of how I'm going to going to view his question, because obviously the stuff on, you know, MyAx or NASDAQ or other exchanges... All equity options, too, they're, like they're markedly different outside of, you know, your SPX and your VIX, which are exclusive to SIBO. I'm assuming you don't mean, mean SPX and VIX. You mean the whole universe there. Uh, so in, in general, broad 10,000 foot, uh, you're talking effectively, you know, equity options or options on equities and indices, and then effectively futures options. That's the broad 10,000 foot difference, really. Uh, obviously, those are options primarily on futures. And there are some places where they overlap, like the S&P. For example, both the SIBO and the CME have options on the S&P. Uh, so, and they sometimes, when they're in, the, in, those, in those serials, in the quarterlies, in particular the quarterlies, uh, outside of the serials, that's when they line up pretty much very well. Uh, but outside of those moments, you know, you have uh, the big and mini S&Ps on the SIBO. You have SPX uh, sorry, on, the, on the CME. You have SPX on the SIBO. And uh, variations therein. You have weeklies, all these other things. But outside of those, uh, it really is a different beast. Uh, primarily, you're talking options on stocks, so the multiplier is going to be different. The underlying is obviously markedly different. A stock is a much different beast in the future. Remember, if you're trading an option on a future, now you have two expiration dates, not just one. And how many times you as a stock trader out here coming to this show, let's say you buy Apple and it moves against you. It hasn't happened lately, but let's say that happens. Uh, what do you say now? Oh, well... You probably don't sell it. You say it's a long-term hold, right? You can't really do that with the future because if A, the future is marked against you all the time with all the different ticks, and then B, it has an expiration date. It goes away. So there's the challenge of kind of the dual expirations you have to deal with in addition to the different multipliers and everything else, in addition to the different contract specs that uh, pretty much vary in terms of multipliers and everything else depending on which product you're looking at. CME has a a vast array of products. I mean, we talk about them every week on our This Week in Futures Options show, so I encourage you, if you're intrigued by that, 6654P, to check out that show if you haven't already. But you can trade, you know, ags, metals, you know, equity indices, you know, you name it. Crude oil, you, the sky's the limit. Dairy, fluid milk, lean hogs. You can trade options on whatever, pretty much almost anything you want over there. Uh, so, but they're all going to be different in terms of multipliers and everything else. Uh, a few other things uh, to note, uh, top level. Uh, most of the stuff they have on, on CME is pretty much predominantly European. Not a lot of early exercise going on over there. So that's all these questions we're getting about exercising early. Not really an issue for most of the CME things. Uh, also, margin treatment is going to be a little bit different. Uh, but why? I guess why they're viewed differently, the broad 10,000-foot thing is predominantly options on futures on one venue and predominantly options on equities on the other uh, dan anything you want to add on the you know the differences between futures options and equity options yeah just a couple things um first of all uh you know uh thx 1138 or whatever your name is uh thanks that for would be a better name thx 1138 i like that better <laughs> yeah uh, first of all thank you uh for acknowledging that because i will tell you what um like Everybody in Chicago, uh, like anybody who's like in the options space, who is, you know, as far as professionals, most of them in Chicago, obviously, right? Like we see like the difference, like it's com two completely different things. Like they're, for, I mean, I, I don't remember if you mentioned this, Mark, but like they're regulated, like securities options on stocks are regulated by the SEC. You know, the other stuff from CME, like that's reg regulated by the FTC, uh, CFTC rather. So, um, you know, they're two completely different things. But, like, if you talk to somebody from New York, they're like, oh, yeah, options and futures, you know, yeah, all that crap. It's all in the same bucket, you know. And it's like, what are you talking about, you know? So thanks for that acknowledgement. I 
I appreciate that deeply. Um, but yeah, besides just that they're regulated by different entities, you know, I think like, I don't know, I'm a little bit, in case you guys, after watching, how many episodes of this did we do so far, Mark? Oh, many, well over 100. I'll take a look at the exact number, but well over 100. Yeah, I mean, in case you guys haven't realized this after listening to well over 100 episodes, I'm a, just a little bit of a dork, but in, in some ways. I mean, generally speaking, I'm extremely cool, but, you know, in some ways I'm kind of a dork. No, no, you're mostly a dork. I'll, I'll go along with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 the line is a gray area. It's a fine line between sexy and sexist. Um, so anyway, let's just pretend I didn't even make that reference. Um, what what commodities options grew out of is uh, like commodities. You know, like uh, if you trade corn or soybeans or wheat, like it's five thousand bushels. Why? Because that happens to be how many bushels fit in the train rail car. You know, like. And so that's why the contracts are sized that way. They're sized for very practical delivery methods, you know. But but then when it comes to options on stocks, well, actually, they're also kind of sized for practical delivery methods, 100 shares, you know. So so I don't know. I'm just kind of adding some color to what Mark said. And by the way, I looked while you were talking in that lengthy, lengthy answer. <laughs> I had plenty of time, so thank you. Uh, actually, I was wrong. Oh, 75 we've done. I thought we did over 100. So 75. Uh, maybe just talking to you, it seems like well over 100. Uh, but uh, it's 75. <laughs> 75. So this is episode 76. Uh, and I, I didn't even get into this. So you accuse me of being long-winded, then you go into regulation. I love it. I didn't even go there. So uh, I purposely avoided the regulation, and then Dan steers the ship right into it. So well done there. Well done there, sir. All right, let's see. Paul. Paul's up next. Paul Vasquez. He wants to know, well, i got a lot of expiration and, like, assignment questions here, which is interesting. Uh, when is the, quote, official close as far as options expiration is concerned? I've had calls assigned and had stocks put to me when the strike was out of the money at market close but it moved in and out during after hours trading. Any light you can shed on how options work would be appreciated. Thanks, Paul, from Sacramento. So lovely scenic Sacramento. Hope things are nice. Usually they are, so I guess I don't have to hope too much uh, for that. Paul, yeah, I, you've noticed that, have you? You've noticed that <laughs> what happens in the immediate after hours after ex expiration tends to affect things, and that's a, good, that's a good takeaway lesson for everyone listening at home right now is that, you know, you have this, perception when you first come to options is bam close yeah, okay it's over we're done let's get the heck out of dodge let's go have a beverage or whatever the case may be no you're not done uh, particularly if the uh, underlying is hovering around your strike or if perhaps there's some interesting events going on in the after hours maybe earnings is after expiration uh, if that's the case as paul and many of our listeners have learned often to their dismay the game's not over. The game is still afoot. You have, the, you have several hours at least until after expiration. Uh, and again, it kind of depends on the mechanics of your broker with the exact specifics uh, you have. But usually you have that window of typically, let, let's just call it three hours for, for just clarification's sake. It's going gonna, it's gonna to ebb and flow depending on how you do it. But uh, in general, around that time frame uh, in which things can happen in the underlying. And savvy people are out there watching that. And if they see the stock starting to rally, let's say our old friend XYZ, let's say it's around uh, 54 again. Uh, and it closed at like, 54 even. But there's earnings in the after hours, uh, after expiration. And, or, or after expiration that same day. Uh, and so you think, oh, you're, you're short the 55 calls. Okay, I'm done. These calls went out worthless. I'm going to go and do something else or go pick up my kid or have a beverage, whatever the heck the case may be you do after the close. And then you forget about them and walk away. And then you come in the next day and the stock's 57 after earnings. And you say, wait a minute, what's this where I'm short a ton from the 55 strike? Uh, it's because someone was watching that in the after hours and the earnings was announced. Let's say the stock gaps up immediately after the close within the next half an hour or so. Uh, and it gaps up to 56 guess what someone's going to do? They're going to exercise those 55 calls they have sitting there because they're no longer worthless. Uh, the stock is actually above it. They may have gone out worthless, but that's not where the game is. The game is not done yet. Uh, so they exercise, though, buy the stock at 55. The stock's now at 57 in the after hours. So that's obviously a profitable trade for them. You, meanwhile, weren't paying attention. Hopefully you weren't naked short those calls. Hopefully you had them against something, your stock, because uh, then guess what? Your stock's going to go away. 
Uh, so you might come in the next day and be like, wait, wait a minute, I'm flat all of a sudden. What happened? Oh, my calls got exercise and now I have short stock. I had long stock. It all got wiped out. Uh, so a lot could happen there if you're not prepared for that, uh, which is why uh, you definitely need to pay attention in those few four hours. Unless the stock, you know, your strikes way away and they have no relevance, really, then you can kind of not worry about those. But this kind of goes back to a lesson we've said many times, and I'm sure Dan will reiterate it when I toss it to him. Uh, but this is the lesson we said many times on this show. You don't have to worry about this stuff if you close your positions out before expiration. People will always ask, why do we always beat that drum so hard? That's why. For stuff like this, for the unknown unknowns that lurk out there waiting for you if you're not prepared. If you close this up out ahead of time, guess what? None of this stuff's going to matter to you. You can go off and, and have your beverage, pick up your kid, whatever you want to do, free and scot-free, carefree, having a good time because you did the right thing. If the people who don't, they're the ones who get caught up in this. All right, Dan, now I turn it over to you. So what do you have to say about, I'm sure you've had a lot of questions about this. People come into MTM. What happened, dude? I got, I'm short all these, all these shares now. I, I thought my calls went out worthless. What happened? Yeah, well, one thing, I would say the most important thing that Mark said is it's have a beverage or pick up your kid, not both. Yes, not both. Time. Preferably not both. <laughs> right. And not while driving, certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, um, it, it's funny. Yeah, uh, the, the OCC has their own specific cutoff time for, like, final, final. But your brokerage firm has a cutoff time somewhat before then. So call them and make, sh make sure you know. And just like Mark said, the pros are always watching. Here, and here's a funny story about that. <clears throat> like anything can happen after hours that's surprising. And there was one time when I was, uh, this is down when I was in the pits, I was short uh, a bunch of these calls that were right at the money. And, you know, you don't like to be short calls because you have pin risk. And you don't like to be long calls because they're going to, that's, the fastest decaying. So there was a guy in the pit who, who was uh, long a bunch of them and he needed to sell them. And I don't know, I kind of wasn't thinking these like, yeah, I, I've, I've got some calls to sell, you know, do you want to buy them? I go, yeah, buy them. And I was short, like, I don't know, it was a long time ago. I forget, maybe like 38 of them. And he had like 70 or something. And so, like an idiot, I said, buy them, which means I'll buy all of them. And so I, I bought extra, and I'm like, oh, well, I just went from having a problem of being short to the problem of being long. I'm an idiot. What, you know, this really sucks. And so uh, what happened is, total coincidence, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I can't see the future. But right after the market closed, the stock rallies up, you know, and so I ended up making a bunch of money. And he was all pissed off at me. He's like, what, what the, you know, what the heck, you know, like I didn't, you know, first of all, you crammed him down my throat. Let me guess. Know? He tried to bust it afterwards. You didn't want that. Right. Uh, let's, let's, let's bust that. We didn't do that. Right. Right. Oh, and one more thing to interject. Uh, you said you were in Sacramento, uh, before I forget, uh, in what, like a week or so I'm going to be in Sacramento, uh, um, Rancho Cordova. Um, I'm having a free presentation. Did you, Mark, do you mind if I throw in a quick little uh, pitch for that go right ahead, now? Do your plug. Okay. Uh, you can go to join.markettaker.com slash San Fran Prez, like for presentation. Uh, so join.markettaker, two T's in a row, uh, no S. Join.markettaker.com slash San Fran Prez and, and register. It's a free presentation. I'm doing a couple out in San Francisco. Uh, area, you know, the Bay Area, and also a couple in Sacramento. So please join me in person. I feel like the third person I've talked to in like the past week was going out to like that those that area of California to do pre. It must be like options clubs out there. Or I, usually, particularly Southern California, not so much the San Fran area, but you know, you typically the Southern California is like an options wasteland. Like there's nothing going on there from an options perspective. Uh, but uh, yeah, it sounds like California becoming uh, interesting, interesting fertile ground there for some options education so check it out uh, mr p's uh, work good question paul maybe paul paul you should show up if you hear this in the next uh week or so all right next up we got oh by the way we got in the chat here we got uh mark brandt long time listener he liked your reference uh to uh thx there dan he, he says uh great movie lucas's usc thesis film yes that's uh thx uh, what was it 11 was it 1138 something like that it was 138 something like that was the name of the movie but uh, uh yes he, he picked up on your reference there dan so so well done <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, L, another creatively named person. LL6. 
<laughs> Why did many options fail? Are they done for good? Um, well, how long you got? But yeah, in general, the, many, the failure of many options ranks up there for me as one of the uh, more surprising developments. Uh, I, I've been around this space for a while. We obviously interact with a lot of different aspects of the options world. Brokers, traders, exchanges, you guys out there in the audience, the professionals, retail, all of the above. And when, when minis were in the lead up, when they were coming, when they were learning on the horizon, it was everybody universally across the board, all different aspects of the space were super excited about. This was going to be the thing. This was going to be the next hot thing. Forget VIX, forget all these other things. Minis, baby. Minis were where the action is. Because remember, back then, Apple threatening 700. No one could afford to touch it. Uh, so the, op the notion of having something that could let people trade more Apple, which is what everyone wanted to do, as well as I think they were talking... Uh, they were talking S&P and maybe some gold and a few other things to start. They had five names they were going to launch of at the start. Uh, that was going to be a great thing. Everyone was super excited about it. There's going to be more to come. And then they launched and kind of immediately withered and died on the vine. <laughs> and uh, the reasons for that are, are many in Legion. But I think because of that enthusiasm, everyone saw it as kind of a, a, almost a guaranteed success. And so they really kind of went at it hard from trying to milk it. Uh, exchanges charge full exchange fee, even though it was effectively a one-tenth size contract. Uh, so people are not stupid. Uh, market makers were a little leery of this thing to start off with because of the full fees and because they, they're always leery. They've been decimated. Their ranks have been decimated. So they made those markets kind of wide to start off with. So they weren't really bringing their A-game in, in terms of tight markets. And then the broker said, hey, everyone's going to love these. Let's just charge full freight and pretend everyone's an idiot and not realize that they're getting a one-tenth size contract for the exact same price as a regular size contract. So you, as the customer now, you're coming in, you're looking at these things. They cost the same amount to execute. They are much wider. Uh, so from a transaction perspective, in terms of the actual execution bid offer, you're paying a lot more in terms of width. So to get a tighter market, you actually got to step up to the big contract. So you're getting screwed on the commissions, you're getting screwed on the actual execution, uh, and you're getting a smaller size contract to boot. Why would you touch them? And the answer is you wouldn't, and no one did. And after a few months, everyone said, well, we kind of screwed this up, and they kind of shut them down. Uh, so that's kind of in a nutshell why they failed. Everyone kind of got greedy, got a little stupid, got a little bit ahead of themselves. And the market makers don't really have the bandwidth they used to to adapt quickly to new products the way they used to. So they started off pretty, t pretty wide. And again, they probably some blame could be laid there too. They probably could have come in a little bit more aggressively and tighter. And then I think the final nail too was Apple split, right? And so once that happened, it kind of eliminated one of the primary driving forces for these products, which was to get at Apple, which was pushing 700. Now it's much more reasonable again. So that was, if there was any opportunity for that, that kind of seemed, that said, I, you know, I do these things every year. I'll talk to people all the time from different aspects of the industry. And I'm going back down to OIC in a couple of weeks, so I'll get the lay of the land there again. But in the, re the past year, I've had heard some rumblings of with things like Amazon and Google and these other popular names, excuse me, over a thousand I have heard some inklings. No one said the word minis to me, but I have heard some rumblings of things that we, let's call, are similar to minis. People think maybe there is an opportunity for that. So I don't know, I don't know if I would say they're done for good, but the initial incarnation, yes, those are done. Dan, is that your take as well as why minis failed, or do you have some, uh, some other area you want to elaborate on? Yeah, no, I mean, that, yeah, that's a really, a really great, um, really great insight, Mark. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, that's the thing is, is the exchange business is, is really, really competitive these days. Um, and exchanges have to keep innovating new products, which in a lot of ways is very, very good for the consumer. I mean, in some ways, maybe, you know, in some ways one could argue maybe not, but in a lot of ways, I mean, that, that's exactly why we love capitalism, why you want competition is because when companies compete against each other for your business, they're forced to innovate. And, and, you know, more choices, especially when it comes to option trading, more choices of things to trade actually begets liquidity and makes tighter markets and, and just gives you more flexibility. So, yeah, I mean... I just hope the exchanges keep trying new things, and I'm sure they will. And, um, you know, some of them are going to fail for whatever reason. And when they do, that's okay. And when they don't, then great. We just have more tools at our own disposal. 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say we see something mini-esque in, again in the future and before we see after hours options trading. I'll put that, that caveat on there as well. Uh, so I think we'll, I've heard enough rumblings. And I've said people, does that mean you're talking minis? And they're like, oh, well, I don't know. So they get a little scared when you say that to them. But uh, there's enough of that out there lurking and enough names that are at lofty valuations now to maybe, maybe we are ripe for the next iteration of minis. Good question. All right, here's a, here's a savvy listener slash watcher of the cover art of the show, Niels. Niels wants to know, why is the logo for this show blue? Good question. Uh, you know, lots of our cover art usually involves our logo in some capacity with some of our other logos and the imagery from the different topics we're talking about, but usually it's some variation on our logo, so they keep the color uh, usually in keeping with ours, which is a nice, deep, quality blood red. Uh, so a lot of that is red. You're right. A lot of our cover art for our network is red. Uh, this show was blue. <coughs> Uh, let's see, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it actually started off, this show, this show has evolved in several ways in the early days. In the early days, we launched it with a firm called Zecco. So it was actually, the cover art was actually kind of a, a gross kind of pinkish purple, <laughs> which was kind of in keeping with their colors and branding. We were kind of mixing it up a little bit with this show. And then uh, we went to another firm uh, called Sogo, and they were blue. So we thought we changed it to blue. And it's kind of just been blue, blue uh, ever since. And then NASDAQ was kind of in blue keeping as well, so it kind of worked for them. Uh, but this show has kind of evolved a little bit in terms of the cover art and how it design was. So that's kind of why it, it's blue. It's just a, a legacy. And we kind of liked it. It, stood, it stands out a little bit in terms of our other shows. And we know you guys like the show as well. So it makes it easy for you to guys to find kind of visually amongst the, the panoply of offerings from our network. But we have a couple of blue shows, actually. Playbook, which is blue because of the old Trade King branding, now Ally Invest. Also blue, and also the options playbook that it's based on is also blue. So that one's blue as well. Also the OIC's wide world of options, also blue, because that's the color they go for. So, yeah, there's a few blue shows on our network. Dan's old daily show, Options News Rundown. It's got some blue cover art as well. So there's more than a few blues. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this one, that's why this one is blue. All right, let's see. we got time for at least one more here. We, damn, we've been answering a lot of questions. Today. This has been fun. Uh, Rad, Rad Hawk. Rad Hawk. We want to know, is the spread delta just the difference of the deltas on the two options? Dan, walk our friend Rad Hawk and our listeners through spread pricing and spread deltas 101, sir. Sure. Short answer, uh, yes. Uh, but let's kind of qualify it just so that we make sure we're giving a really, really accurate answer. You know, like me, uh, and I don't know how Mark looks at it probably the same way I do, uh, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, like I just look at it as if I'm buying one call and selling another call, you know, those are two offsetting positions. Um, but, but some people who kind of like learn it from learning the, the math and, you know, learn it from more the retail perspective, look at it as well. If I'm Buying a call, I have a positive delta, and selling a call, I have a negative delta. Which, by the way, is saying the same thing I just said. But you know, you know, then then I guess technically, really, what you do, what you're doing is combining the the negative with the positive. So technically, adding them together, really, you know, adding a positive number to a negative number, we're really splitting hairs. But the reason why I'm I'm getting like really really nitpicky is because like. If you buy a straddle where you buy a call positive delta and buy a put negative delta, when you combine those, they offset each other, you know, to create a smaller number. So, you know, think about it however your brain works. But, you know, um, yeah, you're you're just you're just basically combining the, the two deltas, if that makes sense. Yep. Pretty straightforward there, uh, Rad Hawk. Uh, just kind of, you're buying one, selling the other. So, uh, you know, yeah, I take one, subtract from the other and you're pretty much good to go. If you want to get into the weeds, check out Dan's uh, courses and of course his book of the options Greeks to get more into the, the nuances there. And all right, let's, let's, let's do one more here, Dan. Or let's, uh, let's end on this one. Interesting one. Interesting name too. Jack Tam. Jack Tam. Let's go with Jack Tam. I like that better. Jack Tam wants to know, is there another exchange educator out there? Other than the SIBO Institute, another astute listener. And uh, the short answer to your question is effectively no. It's pretty much SIBO Options Institute is the last of the Mohegans when it comes to exchange-sponsored, exchange-focused, call it what you will, exchange-centric education. That was not the case 
a while ago. You know, every exchange, when they launched, they thought they had a, a mission, a mantra to educate the public out there about options. So they all had an education arm. Uh, you know, ISE had one, all the big all the big institutes had one, big exchanges had one. Then one by one, they kind of all went away as the exchanges migrated to for-profit companies with shareholders and analysts. And all of a sudden, they're all like, why are you spending all this money educating them, our people, on them options? And so uh, that's exactly what they all sound like, by the way. Apparently, all the analysts are hillbillies. Uh, but uh, so they, one by one, shut them all down. And the SIBO is last of the Mohegans now in terms of that, which is a sad thing. You know, we've seen some efforts at this. We had NASDAQ on this show, obviously, for a while. So they, they paid some lip service to education. They have Jill over there doing interesting stuff. But that's mostly interviews with, you know, fintech firms and things like that rather than options-oriented education. So they're spending money on content, but a little bit different type of content than maybe what you're looking for. Uh, so, yeah, short answer to your question is it pretty much is. Just the SIBO, which I think is a sad... And I've, I've held the exchanges to task. I did a panel recently, not too long ago, at a big industry event, and I kind of lambasted them a bit for saying, you know, you've all kind of washed your hands of this and you left it all to the OIC to do all the heavy lifting, whereas, meanwhile, uh, you guys need to get back in that game. So hopefully we'll see more of that. Uh, not just because it's good for my business to have more people out there talking education, but it's good for you guys uh, because we more people should be out there. They can't just take it... You know, for granted that, and leave it all to the brokers as well. You broker, you guys do this. We're not going to do this. Uh, the exchange, especially Na the click exchange like Nasdaq, they have six options exchanges. I think they have a, a compulsion. They should be at least to be want to get out there and spread the gospel of options. Or maybe you know, ISC or yeah, I should say ICE with with two exchanges now. Uh, they should get out there, you know, or others like that. Actually, and they, so there's a lot of different large exchange groups. SIBO at least owns multiple, so they they get out there and educate. But Dan, you know, you're a former exchange educator. At the Options Institute of all places, uh, has the has the death of that has that kind of uh, has that kind of made you sad, or maybe I guess for you maybe that's a good thing, right? Because it opens up opportunities for you, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, hey, don't get me wrong. I would rather <clears throat> people come to me to learn, you know. But um, I don't. I yeah, I will never understand why the exchanges abandoned teaching people how to better use their amazing tools like holy cow i mean it's called marketing is really what it's called like why would you not tell people about your product uh to me it doesn't make any sense and even the cboe like they still have the options institute but it's kind of a shell of what it used to be it's really unfortunate Yeah, it's no longer the uh, the towering entity, the bastion of education that it once was. A lot of their best guys, are, you know, Russell and others, that have moved on to other things. You're right, and they haven't really replaced them. Uh, so, yeah, there's been issues over there as well, but at least it still exists. It has a chance to once again have a resurgence. But for the other exchanges, yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunately uh, the end of days from an education perspective. That music also means, unfortunately, listeners, it's the end, at least, of this show. Uh, but don't worry, we'll be back doing more. Uh, just from the volume of your questions alone, you can keep us busy for quite some time. We know you guys love it. We want to get this show back out there. Hey, we've been out there. We've been beating the drum saying, hey, anybody want to sponsor an education-oriented show? Unfortunately uh, for you guys, the answer from the industry is like they don't, as we just talked about, they don't really care that much about education anymore. But don't worry, Dan and I still do. So we'll be out there educating you folks. And Dan, if people want to get some of that tasty, tasty in-person action with you, whether it's coming up in California or maybe on some of your retreats and other things, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for the people who live out in California, again, come and see me next week uh, in NoCal anyway, uh, around the Bay Area or Sacramento. It's join.markettaker.com slash San Fran Prez, all one word. So join.market, like stock market, taker, like take something, two T's in a row. Dot com slash San Fran Preds. There you go. And about about your, is your big retreat coming up, or is that that's that's not for a couple months, right? Yeah, my big retreat is coming up in July, and we actually have people coming from all over the world to that. Uh, we actually have. We used to try and keep it small, and we're still keeping a little bit it small, but it's going to be closer to like fifty people this year, as opposed to twenty five, like we kept the past few years. Uh, so. That, no matter where you live in the world, uh, you can travel because that's a three-day event with really intense training. And that's markettaker.com slash wine country. 
So again, market like stock market taker, like take some two T's in a row, market taker.com slash wine country. Uh oh, back to wine country. I guess if, it, if there's worse places to go, right, than, uh, than hitting the old wine country again. That's a fun area here. So, chat, check it out if you want to get a three day dose of Mr. Passarelli ip in your face with some options education. And you listen to a show like this, you may want that. Check it out. You can find it all at market taker. Doc, that's two T's, by the way. I always leave off one T by accident whenever I'm typing that. It's two T's, markettaker.com to learn more. And on behalf of Dan and, indeed, myself, I want to thank all of you out there for continuing to listen and continuing to download the archives of the show. We love you guys. That's why we're doing more episodes for you. And no one's paying us to do this. We're just doing it for you guys because we love you. Uh, so, uh, so stay tuned to the feed. We'll be getting more episodes out there for you, answering questions, all the other good stuff. If you have a question you want to answer on the show, hit us up. You guys know how to find us. And we'll see you next time for more Options Bootcamp. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com.